My name is David Nace, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. This uh, is the session on influenza. If you're here for the session on uh, chimpanzee health, this is not it. Um, it sounds like it might be more fun, though. Uh, and it is not the stroke session. That one was moved actually down the, the hallway. Um, I'm going to just go through the housekeeping um, items that we're uh, asked to do first. Uh, um, Remember uh, that your evaluation forms are very important. Uh, it helps the planning committee greatly in picking uh, topics for the uh, coming year, and we do read all the feedback from these, uh, these forms, and it's really uh, tremendously helpful. So make sure that you do fill those out and hand those in. Um, also remember to uh, sign off on your uh, tracking certificate for your certificate of attendance. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, please make sure that your cell phones are uh, set on stun mode and not on uh, ring mode. Um, I will kind of go through the order of the presentations uh, here today. Um, uh, we're going to have three presentations um, which are interrelated on this uh, topic of influenza. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the epidemiology uh, of influenza in long-term care and its impact on the health of uh, uh, long-term care residents. We're then going to also talk about a project that we um, all worked on for the uh, CDC to develop a uh, health care uh, immunization rate measure that everyone in this uh, room can uh, potentially use. Um, and then uh, we're also going to talk about practical strategies uh, that we can use within our healthcare facilities in order to try to improve immunization rates uh, among healthcare workers. So I'm going to go through the uh, bios of uh, the presenters here first. Um, just in background, I am David Nace. I am with the University of uh, Pittsburgh and I'm a geriatrician. Uh, I spend the vast majority of my time in the area of long-term care. I am the Chief of Medical Affairs for UPMC Senior Communities. My areas of interest, aside from being uh, a medical director, are in the areas of infection control, particularly uh, influenza uh, and healthcare worker vaccination. Um, we have with us also Carmela Smith, who is an epidemiologist and was one of the New Mexico representatives for the CDC project, piloting an NQF measure uh, for healthcare personnel immunization rates. She was tasked with recruiting the healthcare facility participants from New Mexico, and uh, these were participants who volunteered to test this pilot measure. She has coordinated recruitment, training, survey collection, validation interviews, and NHSN beta testing efforts for the New Mexico participants, and has served as their primary contact. Uh, previously, Carmela worked as an influenza epidemiologist for the New Mexico Department of Health's Infectious Disease Epidemiology uh, Bureau. And then we also have Anita uh, G. Varghese. G. Varghese. G. Varghese, okay, um, who uh, is uh, um, with the, uh, oh, this is hard to read. They really are true. These bios are hard to read. So um, she is with the Adult Immunization uh, Program in the New York City's uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Bureau of Immunization, uh, New York, uh, from June 2008 to June 2010. Um, she did her residency in general pre preventive medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York from 2004 to 2007, and a residency in general pediatrics at the New York Medical College at Westchester. Um, she is responsible for the medical oversight uh, of activities conducted through the Adult Immunizations and Influenza Immunization Programs from 2010 to present, and is Deputy Director of Operations and Medical Consultant uh, for school-located uh, uh, vaccination programs, Primary Coordinator of the School-Located Vaccination uh, Program Pilot Project, Pediatrician uh, at School-Based Health uh, Center in New York City, and has conducted research in various child-related urban health issues. Um, and she's a presenter at the oral um, uh, presentation session for the project, Impact of LEED Certified Green Housing on Asthma in Urban New York City uh, at the International Conference of the Urban Health um, 2010. So um, the other housekeeping um, item that we want to go through, uh, the disclosures for all our speakers. Um, uh, both of our other speakers do not have any um, uh, financial relationships that they want to disclose. Um, I just must disclose that I do receive funding for an investigator-initiated grant from Sanofi uh, to study the regular versus high-dose influenza vaccine uh, in long-term care residents. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start, and I'm going to start with the uh, epidemiology of influenza 
and why this is important to us, um, particularly as it relates to healthcare uh, personnel or healthcare worker uh, immunization in this uh, setting. The objectives here are to talk about the epidemiology, um, to point out uh, the importance and the impact of healthcare worker immunization, and to look at what our current performance in the United States is with regards to healthcare worker immunization. Bottom line is, uh, with regards to influenza, what you need to know, it's an RNA virus, it's an enveloped virus, uh, and for us, there are two types that are important, influenza A and influenza B. Uh, influenza B is felt to cause more mild illness, um, and influenza A is felt to be uh, a little bit more serious, particularly for older adults. Um, there have been some recent data looking at this, trying to question is that true or not. Um, but in general practice, uh, it is uh, much more likely you'll see influenza A outbreaks within long-term care than influenza B. Influenza A is the one that is linked to the pandemics. Um, that happen every um, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it is. So um, influenza A has uh, two glycoproteins, uh, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. You'll need to know that in case you're on Jeopardy. Uh, because they will ask that question. Uh, they're referred to as the H and N proteins, and that's what we talk about when we say the H3N2 or the H1N1 strain or the H5N1. Um, that's what we're referring to as the glycoproteins on the surface of the, of the cell. Uh, and most importantly, I, I always put this out because it causes respiratory infections. It does not <coughs> cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. That was my talk yesterday, so that was norovirus. So uh, that's very important because a lot of our, our uh, healthcare workers in the long-term care setting uh, say, well, they've got the flu. They had the flu shot, they've got the flu. What are they doing? Well, they have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. It's not the flu. So it's a constant, you know, they refer to it as a GI flu, and uh, it's a constant re-education that you need to do um, in order to get that myth out of the population that the flu shot uh, doesn't protect you or it causes the flu. Um, the impact of seasonal influenza is great. It's about 5 to 20 percent of all people in the United States annually. Um, about 226,000 hospitalizations, so a quarter of a million hospitalizations. And the rate of hospitalization actually is increased in older adults. About 560 out of every 100,000 older adults are hospitalized, hospitalized annually for influenza. Um, this is actually a kind of an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, the annual death rate from influenza is felt to be around 36,000. That's the figure that we have used for 4,000 millennium. Um, in the past uh, couple of years, they've uh, updated that analysis. Uh, the CDC has gone back and looked at the uh, death rates from influenza uh, based on the information they had, and they, it, it ranges between 3,000 and 50,000 a year. Um, it was a nice paper, a good exercise. The bottom line is 36,000 is pretty close to right where it is. It depends on whether the uh, strain is a, a weaker strain um, or is it a more significant, such as an H3N2. Uh, does it match the circulating flu vaccine strain? Uh, there are many things that go into it, but the key here is that somebody dies from flu every year. Um, and I often tell people that I work with, I've actually buried people from influenza every single year, except the last two years now. Um, hospitalization and mortality are higher when the H3N2 strain actually circulates. Uh, so that's the one that is of particular interest. A couple years ago in 2009 when we saw the H1N1, the mortality rate among older adults was actually lower, even though it was an epidemic. Uh, and it's probably because immunity does last to influenza, despite what we think. Um, and most of those individuals um, who were older adults at that time were exposed before 1956 to the H1N1 strains. 90% of all deaths from flu are in our population, older adults, particularly long-term care residents. Um, and the risk is greatest the older you get, so above the age of 85, you're 16 times more likely than being a younger, older adult uh, in that 65 to 85 category. Um, and in long-term care, why I think this is important and why I became interested in this um, is the fact that the case fatality rate can be as high as 55%. Um, I went through medical school, I went through my residency, I went through my fellowship, and I never saw flu. I knew it existed because I read about it in a micro book, but I never saw it until I became a medical director and opened my eyes. Um, it was there. I had missed it all those years. Um, but when you see death rates starting to spike in February or March, and it actually correlates to what happens in the community with flu, you realize that flu is here, it's serious, and oftentimes is underappreciated. 
Um, nursing facility outbreaks happen on a regular basis. Um, and why that is is because, first of all, we have a very frail population. Uh, individuals who get this um, and suffer the consequences tend to be in that frail uh, component, in part because there is a reduced immune response uh, to the vaccine. Uh, don't ask me to explain that reduced immune response because there's a great deal of discussion uh, and no one really knows what the answer is. Is it the T cells? Who knows? And, and, and it's really not material. All we know is that the immune response is reduced. Um, and we take all those frail people without a good immune response and we slap them up next to each other, uh, sharing activities. On the dementia unit, they share their dentures, let alone everything else. They're in close contact, and there's no wonder that this thing spreads uh, quickly. Nursing facility outbreaks are, as I said, often unrecognized, in part because testing is not adequate. How many people here do not have access to PCR testing in their facility uh, for influenza? Does everybody have access? Does everybody have access within 48 hours? Okay, so some people do, some people do not. Uh, it's actually amazing that PCR standard is the gold standard now for, for testing for influenza, um, yet despite that, it is not read, readily available in most long-term care facilities in the United States. In Pittsburgh, if you use uh, Quest Labs, it actually gets sent out to Nichols Lab in California. And recently they've changed to Chantilly, Virginia, but that is a, uh, a, a drive to get there. In 2009, during the outbreak, when it uh, started in Mexico, Nichols Lab was overwhelmed because it was across the border. Um, and that led to huge, massive delays. So the availability of testing is, is a major problem. Uh, and the turnaround time, certainly, with that as well. And then the other thing that I think is amazing is it masquerades as anything but influenza. When influenza comes into the building, it doesn't come with a certified stamp saying, I'm the flu. Um, it's not like commercials that you might see, um, uh, you know, for these acute uh, diseases. Uh, it's not mucus as on that one uh, uh, commercial that talks about sinus problems. Uh, what this is, uh, comes in looking like is heart failure. Um, it comes in looking like a COPD exacerbation or simply aspiration pneumonia. Somebody who's had recurrent aspirations oftentimes uh, develop influenza and we just chalk it up to the, to the thing they had the last time. Uh, to look at this in perspective, using the 36,000 uh, figure, this is from the um, National Center for Health Statistics, and it is the uh, mortality rate for various conditions. And you can see we're right on par with uh, death rates from pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, motor vehicle accidents. Um, flu causes more deaths than HIV. Uh, it doesn't quite cause as many deaths related to Alzheimer's disease. However, people from Alzheimer's disease die of something not just the Alzheimer's, and a lot of times it's flu and those very frail individuals who can't fight it off, or at least pneumonia. Um, Storms is in here. That was kind of fun because that was 2005. That was Hurricane Katrina. Um, and I think there were, if I remember correctly, 65 deaths from that. So another trivia fact for you. When does influenza occur? Um, we know that influenza occurs in the winter months. There's no surprise there. We tend to think of the flu season as October and maybe through December but it is actually all year round. Um, the vast majority of flu season is in the winter months, October through to and including April, um, but it can occur in June, July, and August, as has happened in recent years. And you can see it, it, from year to year, it, uh, it will have this spike typically in the winter months. Sometimes it comes a little bit early, um, but there is a cyclical nature to it. And I apologize, I was gonna update this slide for yesterday's uh, data. Um, and I did not do it yet, but this line is up right about here right now. So we're just under the, the endemic baseline. These are the number of influenza-like illnesses uh, cases reported through, their, through our surveillance network. Basically, we have sentinel providers around the country who, whenever they see somebody with influenza-like illness, which is fever of 100 degrees and cough, or fever in 100 degrees and a sore throat, um, they mark them down. They say, we saw so many patients. We saw many, so many patients with ILI. They send that in, and that's where this data comes from. It's not proven influenza, but it is actually a pretty, uh, uh, pretty good marker of what influenza activity really is. Uh, we also, through the ILI network, submit uh, cultures for, for verification in some of those cases. This is important because uh, the, the flu season peak uh, it tends to be in February. That is the typical month when we think about it. How many people think we have a, a uh, lame flu season this year, a, a mild flu season? Okay. <laughs> Most people when you talk to will say that. I will say we haven't seen flu season yet. It hasn't happened. 
So it's not mild, it's just not here yet. You can see a number of cases occur in March, and right now is where we're starting to see the peak of that. So, um, so whether this is a weak season or not has yet to be determined. It is a delayed season. So that is, I think, an important fact. And as a matter of fact, if you have anyone in your facilities right now who are not vaccinated, vaccinate them. So it is still appropriate to vaccinate people all the way through the end of what you're seeing as flu season. So that can be all the way through April, maybe even May, depending on when it comes. This is the latest flu season we've had since the late 1980s. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively unique season like that. So we know that flu is important because it um, has a number of adverse outcomes. Um, it has a major impact on our population. How do we prevent it? And there are basically three modes of prevention. There is patient immunization, healthcare worker immunization, and then the use of antiviral agents. Prevention by vaccination is the single most important thing we can do. It's the most effective means of reducing influenza. And I think we've heard that before in many, uh, in many situations. It's important to, to reemphasize that. It is primary prevention. So it is preventing the disease before it actually occurs. It costs almost nothing. Um, it is the cheapest vaccine, I think, that is out there. Um, and it has few side effects. In terms of serious side effects, there are almost none. Um, so it is safe, it's cheap, and it actually works in a number of cases. It's not perfect, but it works. We talk about antivirals, and these are a great addition to our armamentarium against influenza. There are several problems. There's antiviral resistance, which we see with amantadine, romantadine. You cannot use those agents any longer. Um, we're left with oseltamivir and zanamivir. Um, they are expensive. If you have a 100-bed facility and you cover them for 10 days um, with uh, oseltamivir, you'll spend around $28,000 as prophylaxis. Um, there are side effects, delirium, nausea, headaches, and some that we probably don't know yet. Uh, but most importantly, it's a secondary prevention strategy, which means that the disease has occurred already. It's in your building. People have gotten sick. Um, it's like putting your seatbelt on after you go through the windshield. It will help you for the next accident, but will do nothing for your recovery for the first accident. So what are the problems with patient vaccination? Um, recently, there's been a lot of attention paid. Um, actually, for some of us, we've been knowing this for a long time if you practice in long-term care. Um, but despite high levels of vaccination of long-term care residents, flu still happens in long-term care facilities. And really, there's a reduced vaccine eff uh, effectiveness in people 65 years of older and the frail long-term care resident population. There are many studies that have looked at this. They have varying qualities of the data, um, but the bottom line is many of them show the same thing. And then Mike Osterholm recently did the study in October um, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, um, and he presented it last year at the National Influenza Vaccine Summit. Um, and what they showed was that uh, they looked at the data for effectiveness of the vaccine. How do we determine vaccine effectiveness? Traditionally, we've measured titers, antibody response. So you get the titer, you get the vaccine, and then you see in four weeks whether you mounted a response. But whether you mount a response doesn't necessarily mean whether you're protected or not. Uh, and so they looked at a little bit more stringent criteria. They said, okay, we needed to know whether you had flu, and not just influenza-like illness. We wanted to know that you had laboratory-proven flu with a PCR or with a culture. And the bottom line is, in older adults, there's not a single study that looks at clinical outcomes proven with good methodology showing that the flu vaccine works. Um, so it is something that is a little bit concerning. In long-term care, there aren't very good studies. There aren't many. Um, the study that I am doing is actually one of the only studies that are looking at that frail long-term care population. So um, we do really need uh, a lot more information um, in order to try to uh, determine the exact effectiveness in older adults. That leaves us then with health care. Uh, worker immunizations. And the data behind this is actually uh, based on uh, uh, the several premises. First premise is that as healthcare workers, um, they can serve as vectors. They can bring the flu into the building, they can pass it on through contact with other patients, um, and they have a lot of contact with patients. Um, so there is constant moving in and out of rooms uh, among the long-term care population. Um, and there is also this consideration is not only does it 
potentially protect the patients, but it will protect the healthcare workers. So it's protecting them and their families potentially against influenza, and it's protecting your fellow coworkers. Now, if you hate your fellow coworkers, that's one thing. You might want them to get the flu, but uh, hopefully not, and hopefully that won't happen because we need to preserve the workforce whenever there's a flu outbreak. So um, it's been recommended over two decades, since the 1980s. It's been recommended as a strategy that, that has been important. Um, but it's been largely ignored. Um, this was a study looking at healthcare workers, and uh, this was based on a hepatitis B study that they were doing at the time, and they happened to have a little bit of blood left over, and they measured whether people had, uh, in the fall, antibodies to influenza. Uh, they then subsequently uh, did a uh, blood titer late in the season, after the flu season had arrived, and they looked to see who actually did get the flu. So this was evidence of seroconversion uh, from baseline to follow-up, and these were people who, who did not have the flu shot. Um, so these were people we knew laboratory-wise had influenza. Um, and 23% of individuals came down with the flu. One in five to one in four healthcare workers annually come down with the flu. They asked them, they went back and gave them a survey, and they said, did you have the flu? And 60% said, I didn't have the flu. We know they had the flu. They had laboratory conversion. Uh, yet 60% said, I felt fine. 28% said, I didn't even have a cold this season. So almost a third of individuals um, had flu, didn't know it. These are asymptomatic individuals who are carriers who can pass it on uh, unknowingly. Same thing happened. Uh, this is a great study that, that, that is a classic one that really uh, administered the flu vaccine to recipients, um, and it gave you either the flu vaccine or a saline placebo. Um, the main factor in that study, the main outcome, was that there was no difference in side effects. Um, both vaccines killed you equally. Um, I'm kidding. No, the, the vaccines did not kill you. The side <laughs> effects were not that much different. Um, and uh, they went back and saw actually the placebo uh, arm of this, who actually seroconverted. Uh, and they saw that 42% here um, of the people that seroconverted who did not have the flu vaccine uh, did not recall being sick with influenza. So anywhere from 40 to 60% of people don't know that they have flu. A couple of important studies that you should be aware of and know about um, are the Potter and Carmen studies that were done in the United Kingdom. We could not do these studies in the United States. These were cluster randomized design studies. And basically, there's a lot more skepticism in the United Kingdom than in the United States with regards to vaccination. Um, and these are, I can't believe these are over a decade old at this point in time. Um, but uh, what they found was that in homes where they vaccinated the healthcare workers, um, there was a 10% mortality among the patients. There was a 17% mortality in those homes where the healthcare workers weren't vaccinated, and it didn't matter whether you vaccinated the resident or not. So this was independent of the resident's vaccination status. Same thing, they didn't believe it, so they repeated it, larger sample, and the same thing. 22% mortality when healthcare workers did not get the vaccine, 13%. Uh, when they did get the vaccine, and so it's about a 40% reduction in mortality from influenza. Some of the studies had additional outcomes. I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, then here's a study by Hayward uh, that was a cluster study of long-term care facilities um, and showed a reduction of about five deaths for every 100 patients um, that occurred during the actual flu season. Salgado did a hospital study um, over a 12-year period. Vaccination rates had increased from 4 to 67 percent. At the same time, the laboratory confirmed flu cases among healthcare providers dropped from 42 percent down to 9 percent, and the nosocomial resident cases um, of influenza actually decreased from 32 to zero. So there certainly was a correlation um, in that as well. So, like I said, some of the studies measured influenza-like illness in addition to mortality. Um, hospitalizations, that requiring a consult by a general practitioner, that's a United Kingdom thing. Um, hopefully everybody in long-term care is seeing a general practitioner, known as the PCP. Um, influenza-like illnesses, influenza-like deaths, healthcare worker influenza, all those things have been looked at. The studies are more conflicting with regards to those outcomes, but mortality seems to be relatively um, straightforward across all those um, studies. So it sounds great. How are we doing? This was data um, uh, from the CDC. Gary Euler um, uh, helped uh, provide this uh, data, and Megan Lindley, uh, and many others. Um, and this is data uh, that you can see from 2005 season up to the 2009-2010 season, uh, measuring this through the National Health Interview Survey. Uh, and the immunization rates for healthcare workers are pretty flat line. Um, 
I uh, have seen people in asystole with bigger blips than this one. Uh, this is about a 42 to 55 percent healthcare worker immunization rate. This has been recommended since 1982 or 85, something like that, uh, and we're still performing so poorly on this. Um, in the last two years, we've reported higher immunization rates, which were up to 62 percent and then 64 percent uh, for the 2010-2011. But you have to look at what they're using for their data. So they go, have gone to a very small sample size of um, uh, an Internet panel, um, and this is a very select population. So these are people on an Internet, access to a computer. Think of your nurse aides. They may or may not have that access. Um, so I'm not quite sure how this is actually um, I, I'm not sure of the accuracy of this. Um, and uh, that's actually a subject that they're, they're actively looking at. Um, even still, this is well below the current Healthy People 2020 goal of 90%. Um, this was uh, uh, based on it when they broke it out by sites. All sites came in about 63%. Hospitals had the highest rate last year. And then nursing homes came in around, or long-term care came in around 64%. Home health was down around 50%. And you can see in terms of nurse aides and assistants, it was about 55%. So they seem to be a relatively low target group. Um, physicians tend to be about 84%. Another reason I'm not quite sure I believe that data, but not that I don't trust physicians, you know, but I am one, so I don't trust them. Um, <coughs> Vaccination by work setting uh, uh, from the uh, flu vax data. Uh, this is on the cdc.gov website, backslash flu. You can get to this flu vax view, and it will tell you immunization rates. Um, great data on here if you want to look at it, um, if you're like me and get all excited about this stuff. Um, uh, you know, the, the long-term care facilities um, as of February were about 45% for healthcare worker immunization rates. So we've talked about this, and, and they feel that this will be up in the 60s. They said we, they noticed the same pattern, interim results lower last year, and then was a little bit higher towards the end of the season. I have absolute faith that number won't hit 65%. Um, so I am a skeptic. I don't think we can, can really see that much of an increase. But uh, we'll see what ends up happening. So that's my own opinion on it. So um, is it possible? So it's been recommended. It's important. We're doing badly. Can anybody do this? Can a single facility raise their health care worker immunization rates? And this was study, uh, some of the, the pilot work that I did early on um, with, uh, with one of our facilities. Um, we showed that it is possible to raise rates up into the 60%. It was possible to sustain, to sustain them over time. We actually reached up to about 95% with our health care worker immunization rates at that facility. Voluntary program, not mandatory. Um, so the only thing we did require was a declination form in here. We removed the declination form uh, about this year. Or no, this was the, uh, this was the uh, uh, shortage year, the 04, 05 year. Um, it did, once the declination uh, was removed, it did actually decline. Um, I don't have that data on here. Um, that led to, okay, well, we did it in one facility. So what? Can we do it in more than one facility? So we did a quality improvement improvement network of about six facilities in western Pennsylvania. And our goal was to improve immunizations among the residents for flu and pneumovax, but also for the healthcare workers in terms of flu. And this was one of the end of Pfizer uh, quality improvement awards. Uh, we showed that there was a, um, in the collaborative group, these were individuals, uh, facilities who uh, formed a team. They came to a training session. It was a one day, or it was actually a half day session. Uh, they received the, uh, the American Medical Directors Association toolkit, uh, other information. Uh, they were on a listserv, and they increased their rate about 10% or 11% uh, over the course of one year. The group that just got the toolkit with no education uh, dropped by 3.5%. Um, so it was an improvement, but it wasn't that great. It's only 10-11%. Um, and what we did was we held a focus group feedback. There are two types of barriers individual barriers which pertain to the person, why I didn't get the flu vaccine. So the typical things come up, the usual suspects, I'm afraid of needles, oh, I don't get sick, I'm healthy, nothing ever kills me, um, I'm too busy to get the vaccine, all those things, um, why is it really necessary? Um, when we looked at the other barriers, the organizational barriers, um, two things came up. One was the competing demands. Now, I'm sure no one here has ever seen this, where the surveyors walk into a building and everything shuts down. That doesn't happen in most places, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there are, you know, pressure ulcers, falls, the DEA, all those things seem to be much more important. But um, 
That was a major thing that we needed to compete with. And the other thing was that came up was an unknown barrier before, which was staff turnover. Um, the group really felt that people were learning where the time clock was, and they didn't have time to learn what the policies were. And particularly as it relates to the nursing administration and the facility administration, if you have a new DON every two to three years, you're not going to know your flu policy, which you administer once a year. So that became a very important issue. Um, We've addressed this. Actually, uh, this has uh, not been published yet, um, but is in the process of being written. will be submitted hopefully in the next month. Um, this was our work to try to overcome staff turnover. We can't fix staff turnover. So what we could do is take it out of the hands of those people turning over. The, the, we took it out of the nursing policy and procedure manual, and we put this uh, within the domains of the pharmacy policy and procedure manual because no one likes to change their long-term care pharmacy that often. Um, it happens, but rarely. <laughs> so we showed that in the pre-intervention years from 01 to 04, you can see the, the baseline performance. But all 14 facilities in our, our long-term care pharmacy network are at 60%, which was the Healthy People 2010 goal. Um, we have um, eight facilities um, that are 80% or greater. The ones in color, the, either the orange or the reds. So eight out of the 14 are at 80% or better. And three out of the 14 have reached the Healthy People 2020 goal of 90%. Um, I will point out, though, that it is uh, an effort uh, uh, that you need to continue over time. So they're, they're increasing each year, but you have to continue doing this. Uh, it is a voluntary program. No one is mandated to do this. Um, they do require the declination forms in all facilities at this point in time, but they're not tracking them. So um, we can talk about that in a little bit. So. Uh, what are the difficulties, aside from this, in reporting healthcare worker immunization rates? If you look at studies, each study uses a different definition for what their healthcare worker immunization rate is. Um, and that became a big problem from national reporting. And our uh, next speaker is going to talk uh, about that. Um, uh, in particular, we had these debates over, you know, should we just talk about direct caregivers or the indirect caregivers, the administrator or the um, health maintenance person? Um, should they be included in these, in these numbers? Um, how about facility paid health care workers? Should it be people who are paid or unpaid? Um, what about credential people, physicians? Should they be included in your immunization rates? Because they do come into the facility and actually uh, from our neurovirus outbreaks, one of our physicians was, a, was an incident uh, case for neurovirus. They can certainly bring in flu too. Um, contracted employees, so the physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy department, um, and uh, the other question is, okay, are we talking employees during any part of the year or just during flu season or just during October or just from October to December? What do we really mean? And that's what we'll talk about um, in our next uh, presentation. So the bottom line is flu is here. It's serious. It's important. Vaccination uh, is important, but older adults may not respond the way we want to. And we have data on health care worker immunizations improving outcomes for patients. So coverage rates are less than optimal, and we really have to do something to improve them. Um, and there's a need to standardize what we mean when we say healthcare worker immunization rates. So I will have Carmela come up, and while she's coming up, I'm going to try to find the next slides. So. There we go. Oh, okay. And if you have a couple of questions, it's okay. Uh, what we're going to try to do, though, is have a panel at the end to, to answer questions. So. Okay. My name is Carmela Smith. Um, I worked on the CDC pilot uh, entitled Healthcare Personnel Influenza Vaccination Reporting. This is from 2010-2011 flu season. So there were several contributors, um, several from oops, do that again. Several from CDC, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, University of California, San Francisco, New Mexico Department of Health, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and California Department of Health. So just a brief, brief background. Uh, Dr. Nace already went over a lot of this. Um, healthcare personnel 
who get vaccinated help reduce transmission of influenza, uh, staff illness and absenteeism, and of course, influenza-related illness and death, especially in high-risk populations, such as those in long-term care facilities. Um, influenza outbreaks have been associated with low healthcare personnel, flu vaccination coverage in the, in the facilities with outbreaks. So the CDC definition, <clears throat> excuse me, for healthcare personnel is all persons paid or unpaid working in healthcare settings who have the potential for exposure to patients or infectious materials. So this includes a lot of people. <laughs> um, many healthcare personnel are not vaccinated, however. Um, in 2008, um, it was 40, about 45 percent, um, and during 2009-10 season, it moved, got bumped up to about 62 percent. Um, uh, during the CDC or the CDC um, study that Dr. Nice mentioned, the 10-11 season, the data was at about 63.5 percent and 64.4 percent for long-term care facilities. Um, but it was 98.1 percent among healthcare personnel with an employer requirement. <clears throat> and as Dr. Nace said, the Healthy People 2020 goal um, is 90 percent. So we're still far from that goal. The Joint Commission, uh, National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, Shea, HICPAC, they all recommend measurement of um, influenza vaccination among healthcare personnel as an important part of patient safety. However, um, there's a substantial variation in facility policies regarding flu vaccination of healthcare workers, including the tracking of this kind of data. Uh, a standard measure um, would facilitate the comparison of rates within and between different facility types and also aid in the identification of um, target groups with low vaccination rates, which is the whole point of tracking. Um, the National Quality Forum issued a time-limited limited endorsement to a CDC-sponsored standardized measure uh, for reporting healthcare or worker flu vaccination rates. The measure was designed to ensure that reported healthcare personnel flu vaccination data are accurate and complete within a single institution and also comparable across institutions. And the measure was pilot tested to assess the feasibility of collecting and reporting this kind of data. So the pilot participants, um, we recruited participants from Western Pennsylvania, New York City, California, and New Mexico. The facility types included were acute care, hospitals, long-term care facilities, dialysis centers, uh, ambulatory surgery centers, and physician offices. The first uh, part of the pilot was a qualitative assessment. This was a purposeful sample of facilities from those that had already been recruited. Um, and uh, to take part in a pre-survey qualitative assessment. The participants were emailed uh, documentation, web links, and also the um, protocol. They participated in a 15 to 20 minute semi-structured phone interview using a 10 question um, tool. They asked participants open-ended questions focusing on um, how they thought the measure, uh, the barriers to the measure, the facilitators, um, how easy the tool was to use. Um, and the responses that they got really guided the, um, the content of the surveys that made up the pilot. So in the data collection, we weren't just asking for rates. That wasn't the bulk of what we were after. We were looking for um, what, what are the facilitators and barriers to collecting this kind of information, collecting and reporting. Um, so we asked the participants um, to describe their institution and their vaccination program, their campaign efforts, their data collection processes, um, their perceived barriers to reporting the data using the measure. The categories for the healthcare workers, um, the denominator categories, uh, consisted, it consisted of all healthcare personnel with or without direct patient contact, working full or part time at the healthcare facility, and they were grouped into three mutually exclusive categories. The employee group was defined as all persons who receive a paycheck directly from the healthcare institution. Again, this is all persons, so this isn't specifying job title at all. This is janitors, construction workers, along with um, licensed personnel taking care of patients. Uh, the credentialed non-employee group was defined as licensed practitioners affiliated with the institution who didn't receive a paycheck directly from the institution. 
This included physicians, mid-level providers, technicians, therapists, agency nurses. The other non-employee group, these are the non-licensed personnel who are affiliated with the institution. So this is students, trainees, resident physicians, fellows, also lab technicians that might be on site. So the data collection. The numerator data was counted as of the day the health care institution began administering vaccine for the 2010-11 season, and it went through March 31, 2011. That was our end date. The numerators consisted of four mutually exclusive categories reported separately for each of the three denominator groups. So these were the total number of health care workers who received a flu vaccine offered at the institution, at the health care facility, those that received it elsewhere, those who had a medical contraindication, and those who had a documented declination. This is our data collection form. Participants were emailed a link for each of the three surveys, and they just clicked on the link and were able to report their data using this form, along with the other questions related to the barriers and institutional characteristics. They could scroll over the categories to get the definition again if they didn't have their protocol with them or didn't read their protocol. The facilities were asked to submit three data reports, as I said, to the secure website. The initial report was just denominator data, and that was from October 1st through October 31st. We also asked them questions about their facility, the demographics, and about their flu vaccine program. The interim report was data as of December 31st, and so this is cumulative. They were asked to just add the numbers sequentially for these three surveys. In the interim report, we also asked them about their campaign activities, data collection methods, and perceived barriers. The final report was numerator and denominator data as of March 31st, and we also added questions about how they promoted the flu vaccine, so not just their flu campaign activities, but then how did they go a step further and continue to promote vaccination. The next step was validation. We did an inter-rater reliability exercise of the reported vaccination status determined by record review. We used this to assess the agreement of the classification of individual level numerator and denominator data between two raters, so this was looking at what each facility participant had reported, and then one of the state reps or jurisdiction reps would go in and look at their data to verify. We also did a case study exercise where we asked 23 questions. How would you categorize this type of personnel or that type of personnel? And then we did a Delphi panel analysis to measure face validity. This was nine experts in influenza vaccination and quality measurement who rated measure specifications and then convened to discuss them. The last part of the pilot was an evaluation of the utility of the CDC's National Health Care Safety Network, and this was to determine the feasibility and user friendliness of NHSN as a potential platform for reporting the summary data for influenza vaccination. And this included several activities. They were to attend the instructional webinar, access the demonstration version of NHSN, so they did not need to become a user in NHSN to do this. They created a sample report, filled out a survey, and provided feedback through a conference call. So as you can tell, this was a lot of work for these participants. So I was really excited that we were able to recruit 318 of them who said, I'm going to go ahead and give you of my nonexistent spare time, help you with this pilot. So it was really neat. But only 74% completed all three surveys. So some even went on to do Survey 2, but for whatever reason couldn't finish and do Survey 3 for us. So just quickly, the qualitative assessment we did with 32 facilities from all four of the different jurisdictions. Most had previous experience with measuring flu vaccination. Many said that the barriers to implementing this type of measure 
were accessing the health care personnel information, so getting to the information about vaccination status. Some policies don't even require that they track those who don't receive the vaccine. They just have sort of a campaign effort one day where they offer the flu vaccine and that's it. They don't really go back and ask people that didn't get the vaccine if they had it somewhere else or what their status was. So that was a major barrier that they first saw. And a facilitator, they mentioned, was having a streamlined process to collect the information and establishing a communication pipeline. So a lot of participants who could easily go to the different divisions within their facility, the different departments, and get help in collecting this data, they found that very useful. Some advice that they gave was in implementing the measure was that facilities plan ahead of time, prepare for the burden, and the burden they foresaw was the time, not necessarily the cost, although time is money, but more the time that it would take them to collect and report this kind of information. So the majority of the survey respondents were infection preventionists, more so for long-term care facilities. As I go over the results, I'm going to be showing you the overall, that's all jurisdictions and all facility types, and then we're going to compare it to the long-term care facility results. The facility characteristics, when asked what their previous experience was in offering the flu vaccine, the majority said they had five or more years of experience, but when asked about how long they had been measuring this type of health care personnel vaccination data, the majority were five or more years, but more than for the, I'm sorry, but less than when we asked them the experience they had in offering. So 28.8% for long-term care said they had never measured this type of data. When asked which health care personnel groups did you offer the vaccine to in 2010-11, you know, 100% for long-term care for full-time employees, but as you can see, 61.5% for other non-employees, 61.4% for credentialed non-employees. I think I was on the wrong slide. Okay, so when we asked them about their perceived ease of reporting, many said that they agreed that the CDC tool was easy to use, it was comprehensive, it was relevant to their health care institution, the instructions were easy to understand, the definitions were easy to understand, and many would recommend it. But when asked about how easy they thought it would be to assign health care personnel to these categories, the numbers go down. So for credentialed non-employees and other non-employees, only 47.5% and 49.2% agreed that it would be easy to assign their health care workers to these categories. And when asked about counting, it's even lower. So the mean vaccination rates for long-term care facilities, we found that it was about 58% for employees, 54% for credentialed non-employees, and 51% for other non-employees. This was comparable to the overall data. So the bulk of the data, the barriers that we found. The barriers reported varied by institution type, participant time demands, and internal policies. A significant barrier for many participants was determining the flu vaccination status of all health care personnel in their institution. So again, we didn't specify by job title. We said anyone who's in your facility. And so that was burdensome for many. And then also the ability to determine the status of these non-employee groups were a problem, and those vaccinated outside of the institution. Okay, so this is a graphic showing the percentage of the pilot participants reporting that their ability to determine the vaccination status of a particular health care personnel group was a major barrier. So their choices for this question were not a barrier at all, somewhat of a barrier, and a major barrier. So this doesn't include those that said, yeah, it's somewhat of a barrier. This is just major barrier. And in blue we have the overall numbers, and in red we have long-term care facilities. So the first column is their ability to determine the status of employees. And so, you know, only 12% saw this as being a major barrier in long-term care facilities. 
whereas for the non-employee groups, we can see it's much higher. I think that's pretty significant that 32.2% of our participants said this was a major barrier. Um, and this looks at barriers again, but at the time required. So um, they were asked, um, how much of a barrier is it for you, the, um, the time that you need to dedicate to collecting this kind of information? Long-term care facilities are, in this case, a little bit lower than the overall um, in terms of this being a, a major barrier, the time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So just really briefly, um, we're still um, looking at this data. We're putting together a paper. So the CDC group is um, optimizing this data. But um, for the inter-rater reliability, again, this is where uh, we looked at a document review. Um, there was high overall um, agree uh, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it was it was pretty pretty well um, in sync with what what the um, the people who went to the site the state the state group saw with a, a 0.8 um, kappa for numerator and 0.81 for denominator. So. Um, and looking at, uh, I guess, agreeability or percent reliability, 88% um, for jurisdiction A, 94% for B, and 80% for C. Jurisdiction C could not do the on-site visits, so they had a lot of missing data, and that's why their numbers are a bit lower. 62% um, of the disagreement resulted from facilities reporting verbal declination incorrectly. So we asked in the protocol um, for them to only report the documented declinations in the declination category, and many just took verbal declinations and lumped them in there. Um, the second largest proportion of disagreement was the misclassification of medical contraindications. Um, <clears throat> Of the 43 medical contraindications reported by field participants, more than one-third were classified as declinations by the, the state rep or the, the person doing the, the auditing. And almost 30% uh, incorrectly reported including pregnancy as a contraindication. So the pregnant population was, was a problem in terms of medical contraindications. And the case studies showed good comprehension of the definitions across all facility types. 94% um, completed the 23 um, case study questions. Um, problematic numerator elements related to confusion about how to report healthcare personnel who deferred vaccination all season. And verbal declinations without documentation, we've already uh, discussed that. And among the denominator elements, there was poor understanding of how to classify physicians who were credentialed um, at multiple facilities, um, and also those physicians who were practice owners. The Delphi analysis, uh, there was considerable disagreement among the panel experts regarding the ability to produce valid um, results if verbal self-reported data was used. So. Um, See the other point. Okay, and then they they reached the strongest cons consensus on the validity of the definitions for credentialed non-employees being um, uh, non-employee physicians, advanced practice nurses, and PAs, and other for on, other non-employees, this being just students and volunteers. So they really wanted to see us make it a little bit more narrow of a group there. For the beta test. Um, we collected a lot of great feedback about this, mostly on um, just what kind of resources would you like to see. Many wanted to see instant help, of course. Um, they, their feelings about um, online resources were mixed. Um, they, uh, many wanted to be able to speak to someone by phone if they had problems using NHSN. Okay, so once again, the, the pilot goal was to evaluate the feasibility of reporting healthcare worker flu vaccination data. We found that the non-employee group created particular difficulties. Um, the other non-employee group, the high volumes of students, volunteers, and trainees in acute care hospitals especially, um, credentialed non-employee group, um, healthcare personnel have privileges at multiple facilities, and some are not regular hospitalists, so they're credentialed at a facility and may not even um, practice in that same city. It may be the, the city next to them, and they just happen to see patients there. Um, every now and again. Um, 
there were um, variations in the rates and, and barriers um, depended on the facility type. And I just wanted to show this um, going back to the, the results about time. In long-term care facilities, there are a very small uh, number of these non-employee groups. And so that may, be, um, tell, that may tell us why, for time at least, that number was lower than the overall. This is the median denominator um, numbers. So for long-term care facilities, I think the focus should be on the employees. However, there are still these non-employee groups that we should think about. So because of the pilot, CDC made specific recommendations to the National Quality Forum, and they were to narrow the non-employee groups to those in the facility for 30 days or more, so it's not just any length of time, um, and narrow the list of non-employees to physicians, advanced practice nurses, PAs, students, volunteer, and volunteers over 18 years, years old, so this isn't just any non-employee you can think of. We're really trying to narrow the focus here. and. Um, this, uh, another recommendation they made was to request that only documenta documented vaccinations be included um, in the vaccinated elsewhere category and to specify that the only appropriate medical contraindications are severe allergic reaction to eggs and a history of Guillain-Barre and not these almost 50 that they reported. So um, Anita is going to talk more about how to improve uh, healthcare personnel vac flu vaccination rates. Um, but certainly a feasible measure uh, would allow for this to be tracked um, efficiently and effectively. And I'll leave it at that because I think I'm running low. Any questions so far while I'm pulling over the other slides? Yeah, many make that argument, and they don't realize that it takes um, a, a couple of weeks for the vaccine to actually go into effect. So they get vaccinated, and they get something, I don't know, rhinovirus, anything else. And, well, I got the flu. I got the flu from the flu vaccine. Well, we to it, yeah, I know. I know. I know. Yeah. Well, so just, to, yeah. just to add a comment on that one, I've gotten so frustrated that if they tell me they had the vaccine and within uh, a month of having the flu vaccine, they, they come down with what they call the flu, I make them come in and I swab them and I show them exactly what they had. So, um, <laughs> if you can do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the things that, that I worked on was going to the uh, conducting in-services with staff, and that's one of the things that, that the staff at one of the particular long-term care facilities I visited said, we get, it, we get the flu from the flu vaccine. So really um, focusing on the staff and trying to get them to understand, and then hopefully it will go down into the patient population, and if they can explain it appropriately, the patients will get vaccinated as well. But well, we focused it, the pilot focused on healthcare workers. So the visitor issue is a big one that came up a lot. And you're right, everyone that comes in and out of these huge facilities should be vaccinated, they should be tra tracked. But we were focusing on just getting a handle on the healthcare workers. Um, and the, the reason we wanted the denominator data was just to get a rate and, to, and something to measure. And you need to understand who your, who your staff population is to then go, out, not go after them, but then to try to follow up with them and say, well, did you get the vaccine elsewhere? Because if so, I can mark you or whatever the policy happens to be. Um, I have found that I, I think having just a one-page form where, and you have a clinic where all of the staff can attend, have a one-page form that is mandatory, they fill out the form and they can say, I either have a medical contraindication or I got it at some other facility. And if they can do that, that will suffice in terms of documentation. So they don't necessarily need to have a note from whatever physician or whoever gave them the vaccine. Um, but I think we're getting closer to this 
you know, the panel just didn't like this whole business of, yeah, I got it, or no, I decline, and then we go to look at the records and we don't know. So just getting a better handle on things, really. So, uh, yeah, and I'm actually going to speak a little bit more about some of the common misconceptions and uh, myths that are out there and, you know, sort of strategies that we can use to counteract that. Um, so this talk in general, it, it actually can be applied to almost any healthcare worker-related vaccination, but obviously we're fo focusing on influenza here. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, so I'm going to go uh, through a little bit on the background on healthcare personnel vaccination recommendations and institutional approaches to ensuring employee vaccination, um, and along the way give example, examples of effective strategies and uh, methods that have been implemented. So really, employee vaccination, in particular for influenza, is really the new norm. Um, not having some type of facility-wide policy or program is just not acceptable in today's day and age. Um, the CDC, in a recent MMWR, uh, supported reporting of healthcare worker vaccination as a quality measure and said that vaccination rates within facilities should be regularly measured and reported and that ward, unit, and specialty-specific coverage rates should be provided to staff and to administration to keep everyone in the loop as to how the facility is doing. Uh, the Joint Commission standard requires hospitals and long-term care facilities to establish an annual influenza vaccination program, and this includes staff and licensed independent practitioners, uh, to provide access to influenza vaccinations on site, education, um, educate the healthcare personnel about vaccination uh, transmission and the impact of influenza, uh, monitor annually vaccination rates and reasons for non-participation. Um, in order to implement enhancements to the program to increase participation in future campaigns. Uh, the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, uh, in its revised position paper on influenza vaccination of healthcare workers, uh, states that as a core patient and healthcare personnel safety practice with which noncompliance should not be tolerated, it's the professional and ethical responsibility of healthcare personnel and the institutions in which they work to prevent the spread of infectious pathogens to their patients by following evidence-based infection prevention practices. And for the safety of both patients and healthcare personnel, Shea endorsed policy in which annual influenza vaccination is a condition of both initial and continued employment and or professional privileges. Um, so organizations are taking this seriously. And, you know, it brings the question of how do we go about implementing this? Uh, organizing a large institution um, and delivering vaccinations to healthcare workers and institutions. I know in New York, we have one network that has over 10,000 employees. You know, how do we go about doing this? And there's a number of different frameworks from which we can work from. Um, one is mandating vaccination, accepting declinations only on a restricted basis for uh, people with medical contraindications, for example, um, and noncompliance with the mandate resulting in either termination or the requirement of the healthcare personnel to wear a surgical mask. Um, there are also mandatory participation programs in which declinations are allowed, but they have to be documented, and that usually comes through the form of a uh, declination statement. Some facilities use opt-out programs in which uh, employees are automatically enrolled um, into the program and are set up with uh, appointments with employee health service to get influenza vaccination, um, and they have to actively cancel that appointment um, in order to opt out. Um, and then there are voluntary or opt-in programs, which are, you know, the most common. So this is just a graphical representation, and I actually took this from one of Dave's presentations because I thought it uh, was kind of a nice summary of some of the different approaches. And as you can see, as you start at the base with the voluntary approaches, um, as you go up, uh, there is a greater level of accountability which, with each of the different strategies. Um, the highest rates of compliance have been shown to occur with employer-mandated um, requirements. And uh, some of the highest rates we've seen are up to 98% in uh, institutions like Virginia Mason, BJC Healthcare. Uh, CHOP also has a successful program. Um, although with this framework comes a bunch of issues, in particular uh, pushback from uh, employee rights groups, unions, 
Um, I think a lot of healthcare personnel feel like having the word mandate really impinges on their personal choice and uh, just really does incite a lot of fury in people. Um, along with uh, mandatory policies usually comes a masking policy that goes hand in hand. Uh, the rationale for this is it's a method for source control of asymptomatic but infected healthcare personnel. It protects unvac unvaccinated healthcare personnel from unrecognized influenza patients. It can prompt the healthcare personnel to review more closely the risk benefit ratio for vaccination and hopefully choose to receive the vaccination. Some issues with this include the tracking of vaccinated versus unvaccinated healthcare personnel. Some institutions do this by incorporating uh, stickers onto ID badges or buttons that the healthcare personnel are required to wear. Um, the problem with this is the potential stigmatization of uh, healthcare personnel who have legitimate contraindications and concerns over their right to privacy. Um, one example of a, a successful program uh, with masking occurred out of New Hampshire. There were two hospitals that implemented policies in the fall of 2009 requiring vaccination of all their employees. And if the employees refused, they had to wear a mask for all patient contact from November 1st to March 31st. And they found that in the first year, there was a lot of anger to this new policy. They had to spend a significant amount of time educating their staff as to why this new policy was in place and why it was important. Uh, they had many staff who threatened to leave the institution, and what they found was that none actually did leave. Um, in the second year, they found that the staff were you know, slightly more willing to comply. Uh, they were getting more used to this idea that vaccination was required in the institution. And then by the third year, vaccination really became the norm, and the staff actually reported being proud of their high vaccination rates. Um, in response to this, uh, more than three other hospitals in the area adopted similar policies as well. So this was really, you know, I thought this was really interesting. It can be done. It does take a little bit of time and work, but slowly over time, we do see changes in the institutional culture that impact uh, vaccination rates. Um, so implementing these changes, um, you know, there's several considerations we have to take into account. In particular, some of the unique challenges presented by the long-term care facility itself. So in the combined SHEA and APIC, that's the Association for Professionals in Infection Control, in their combined um, recommendations on infection prevention and control in the long-term care facility, they noted that the long-term care facility is functionally the home for the resident who's usually elderly and in declining health and will often stay for years. Residents are often transferred between the acute care and long-term care setting, adding an additional dynamic to transmission and acquisition of healthcare-associated infections. The problem of developing guidelines applicable to all long-term care facilities is compounded by the varying levels of nursing intensity, facility size, and access to physician input and diagnostic testing. And because facilities differ, the infection risk factors specific to the resident population, the nature of the facility, and the resources available should dictate the scope and focus of the infection control program. So these are all important points to keep in mind, and I think it doesn't go unrecognized, the challenges that go along with implementing these policies. Um, vital to any program is really leadership support and commitment. It helps facilitate change in the institution, helps reduce barriers to access, uh, financial support that's needed to implement some of these uh, methods can be obtained, and I think most importantly ensures an institutional culture where vaccination isn't just encouraged but expected and becomes the norm uh, as an important component of patient and healthcare personnel safety. Some things to keep in mind, what is the definition of healthcare worker? And we just talked about this. Uh, does it include those who don't have direct patient care? Will it include volunteers or temporary staff? Does it include contract workers? You know, sh it should include anybody, we, um, everyone basically, we know that, but how do we keep track of everyone becomes the issue. And you know, the CDC and QF measure uh, addresses this. What type of policy do you want to enforce? Uh, but more importantly, what systems are you going to have in place to track uh, vaccinations versus contraindications versus declinations? Uh, when considering masking policies, uh, you should consider identifiers uh, that are crafted in a manner that positively reinforces the rationale for mask use. And so this is an example of uh, one institution's badge 
identifiers for both vaccinated and unvaccinated personnel. And as you can see on the right, um, there's a picture of a healthcare worker wearing a mask, and it says, I wear it because I care. So it puts a more positive spin on the mask as opposed to patients looking at a mask and thinking something really bad is going on. It lets them know that infection control within the institution is really the priority, whether the healthcare personnel are vaccinated or not. Oh, do you want to use declination statements? Well, these come with some mixed results. Uh, studies have shown that they can improve vaccination rates by almost 12%, but the maximum vaccination rates in facilities generally don't exceed 70 to 80%, whereas with the mandated vaccination, we saw that we can get rates as high as 98%. And so why is that? Well, we can see, I don't know if the pointer's here, but uh, I kind of boxed it out there. It says, uh, the consequences of my refusing to be vaccinated could have life-threatening consequences to my health and the health of those with whom I have contact, including all patients in this healthcare facility, coworkers, family, community, and despite these facts, I'm choosing to decline influenza vaccination. So as you can imagine, people don't really feel like they want to sign something like this and have it on record that they've chosen to put people at risk uh, for the sake of not being vaccinated. And I, what I found with the New York facilities was that a lot of institutions really didn't um, want to use the declination statements because they felt like there was so much pushback from the employees that it was just too much trouble to really maintain. Uh, that being said, um, you know, we do need to track whether the employees have been reached through the employee vaccination campaign, and this is one way to keep track of whether they've declined vaccination and already been approached. And I think any successful forum should include uh, some of these uh, factors. You want to mention the severity of influenza, the asymptomatic nature of transmission, the need for yearly vaccination. Uh, the fact that influenza vaccine doesn't actually cause disease, which is, as we mentioned, a common misconception. Um, and we also want to capture reasons for declination because it can help inform our future programs. Um, effective components of employee vaccination programs really, for the most part, all include one, improving access to vaccination, uh, two, education, and three, promotion. Um, improving access to vaccination, you want to make sure a vaccine is available at no cost to the healthcare worker. You, uh, vaccination av availability of at least one day or more has been associated with increased vaccination rates. Uh, vaccination availability during all shifts has likewise also been associated with increased rates. And the use of mobile vaccination clinics or roving carts has been helpful as well. And uh, just to speak a little more about that, uh, the mobile carts increase access by bringing the vaccines to the healthcare worker. It requires no active effort by the healthcare worker themselves, which is a good thing. Um, they're easily portable and can be paced to accommodate the capacity of the vaccinators, uh, which I think is a very helpful strength uh, to that method. Um, and they can be operated during all shifts, um, including nights and weekends. One example of a mobile cart program took place out of the Minneapolis uh, VA Medical Center. In the 1980s, their vaccination rates for healthcare workers were less than 25%, and so they instituted this mobile vaccination cart program as part of a comprehensive effort that maximized convenience and efficiency. Um, and what they saw in conjunction with um, increased advertising, um, free vaccination, streamlined documentation, standing orders, et cetera, they saw that their rates went up from less than 25% to 46% in the mid-90s, and then as high as 65% um, by 2004. Uh, another example of a program uh, is North General Hospital in New York City. Um, they implemented employee education and ro roving clinics. Um, and they found that the clinics yielded the highest vaccination response in comparison to other sites when, where vaccines were being offered, which included employee health services, the ED, et cetera. Um, and what they found was that actually 84% of the vaccines were distributed at sites other than the employee health service. So it's really important to keep in mind, people are, healthcare workers are busier than ever, and for them to take the time to come to the employee health service can present a real barrier. So educational campaigns are, again, another important component, and uh, they should be designed to increase awareness of the vaccine and to help impact the knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs uh, of the healthcare workers. 
people are weary of the flu vaccine and um, the key messages should really address this and not shy away from it. Uh, some of the key campaign messages should include the benefits of vaccination, the potential impact and severity of illness for healthcare workers and their patients, the epidemiology of flu and its uh, transmission, diagnosis, and treatment, um, and non-vaccine infection control stat strategies such as antivirals, isolation precautions. Um, and I think really important, uh, these messages should also include the ethical responsibility of the healthcare worker to protect themselves as well as their patients and coworkers. Um, and programs should inform staff of the importance of staying home from work when they have ILI. Um, educational programs have been shown to increase rates from about 21 to 38 percent when all of the concerns of healthcare personnel are addressed. Uh, but tailoring education to address the concerns of the intended audience is more likely to result in improved vaccination rates. Um, in one study out of Canada, they looked at factors associated with H1N1 vaccination during the pandemic. And what they found was that vaccination was related to the perception of the risk of the disease outweighing the risk of the side effects from the vaccine um, and concerns regarding uh, their personal or their family's safety. Declination of vaccine was related to a lack of concern regarding the illness and the concern over vaccine effectiveness and safety. Similarly, here in the U.S., um, this is taken from this past season, um, mid-season influenza vaccination coverage estimates, and they had asked healthcare workers why they chose not to receive the vaccine. And, you know, we think we touched upon this. Um, a good proportion believe that they just don't work. Um, many are afraid of side effects. Uh, people don't feel like they need it, and they're worried about getting sick from it. But despite the concern over the flu vaccine itself, healthcare workers still have this feeling that they want to protect their patients. Um, in a study out of CHOP after their mandatory policies were instituted, um, they found that 72% of people surveyed believed that the mandate was coercive, but over 90% said that the policy was important for protecting their patients and their staff and was a part of their professional responsibility. So even though people want to have their choice in the matter, they really do want to take care of their patients. Some other factors demonstrated to increase vaccine acceptance, um, emphasizing the desire for self-protection. Um, people previously receiving influenza vaccine are more likely to receive influenza vaccine in the future. Um, the desire to protect patients and the perceived effectiveness of the vaccine. So, you know, one possible message in years where the strains do match circulating strains, um, it's important to point that out and let people know that we have a good match and the vaccine is going to be more effective this year. Promotional activities. Um, it's really important uh, that all of these campaigns include advertising about the program and getting the word out. And one way to do this is by designating an institutional flu champion, someone whose mission it is to really go out and spread the word and encourage their coworkers um, and colleagues to be vaccinated. Um, we can also do vaccination drives, incentive programs, personal reminders. Um, and I think public vaccination of key leadership is another effective strategy. Um, people need good role models. They want to see um, people practicing what they preach. And so I think that's important as well. So while each of these methods have um, some levels of success, most successful organizations use multiple approaches to increase their rates. And the involvement of a multidisciplinary team early on in the development of a campaign is really important. Um, this is a study looking at the relative impact of various strategies on healthcare worker vaccination coverage. And it looked at various studies that, um, you know, investigated these different strategies. And so we can see for declination statements, um, you know, the overall change in vaccination rates varied between 11 to 22 percent. Mandatory vaccination, there was an increase uh, from 28 to 68 percent in vaccination rates. Um, education and promotion from mid-20s to almost 40 percent. Uh, mobile carts were similar. Um, incentives, educational letters from leadership, and on-site expert education had mixed results and um, in this particular study um, weren't found to be significant. Um, the California Department of Health Services conducted a survey of 30 nursing homes 
And what they found was that um, non-vaccine receipt was associated with problems with vaccine access and misconceptions regarding influenza and the vaccine itself. And so they developed three interventions, um, one, an educational campaign, two, uh, vaccination days where a free vaccine was offered to the staff, uh, and third was the combined uh, a combined program with both education and free vaccine. And then they had another arm that got no uh, intervention and looked at vaccination rates in all four of these categories. What they found was that their baseline rates were about 27%. Uh, people who received the educational campaign, um, rates increased to 34%. Uh, people in the arm that got free vaccine days, rates increased to 45%, which was significant. But the highest increase was seen in people that got both vaccine days and um, the educational campaign, and those rates increased to 53%, which was significant. Um, another example is the HCA network in Tennessee. This is a big uh, network of 163 hospitals, um, many outpatient surgery centers, and over 400 physician practices in 23 states. Um, they put together a mandatory program for clinical employees and people with access to patient care areas. Um, vaccination was encouraged for non-clinical employees and voluntary medical staff, and they did allow declination for any reason, so they didn't restrict it to um, particular categories. And so this graph um, basically highlights the components of their program. Um, so we can see consent uh, or declination form was required of all types of staff, uh, whether they were clinical or non-clinical or voluntary. Um, and influenza vaccination was required for the clinical employees and the individuals with access to patient care areas. And it was encouraged for the non-clinical employees and voluntary staff. Non-vaccine alternatives were offered. Um, people could use a surgical mask um, when in patient care areas, or they could have their workflow revised to eliminate patient contact. Um, whenever possible, or if masking wasn't an option. And for all categories, um, the, they instituted a number of different policies, including free vaccinations, um, education, and um, different infection control strategies. And what they found was that their vaccination acceptance rate went up to 95%. And they accomplished this by putting greater focus on the benefits of this patient safety measure and providing a choice. They didn't have to get vaccinated, but they did have to protect patients from influenza. Um, finally, another example is the Mayo Clinic. Um, early in early 2000s, they created a multidisciplinary program that involved access. They offered multiple clinics and increased um, accessibility to the vaccine. Promotions that included posters, flu champions, and incentives and education um, via ground rounds and different um, employee education programs. And they found that their rates increased to 75% and then the baseline was about 53%. So in essence, multidisciplinary programs um, will yield a better response than using any one strategy um, by itself. So basically when trying to put together an employee program, institutions should consider which program model suits their healthcare personnel most effectively. And they'll have to decide which groups of healthcare workers are going to be included in the program. And most importantly, how are they going to track vaccination status? Um, all the while keeping in mind that va mandatory vaccination policies have been associated with the highest increase in vaccination rates. Uh, institutional leadership support is key to any successful program. Vaccination has to be easily accessible um, for the employees. And a combined approach, a multidisciplinary approach, may be more effective in improving rates than any one or two strategies implemented by itself. And that's it. Okay, at this time I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, in the back. That's a great question. When do you start immunizing? When do you stop immunizing? Um, the uh, time-honored thing that people had always said was wait till October or November. Don't do that. So you should never, ever wait. Um, 
The minute you get the vaccine in your hand is the minute that you should start to administer it to patients, to healthcare workers. Um, and the reason is that uh, there was this fear that if we gave the vaccine too early, it would wear off by the end of the season. That's not true. It's a myth. There was absolutely no shred of evidence supporting that. And back in 2008, there was an analysis um, of all the studies that had been done and really showed that the, the flu vaccine uh, did not, the, the immunogenicity did not wear off after six months, as we often believed. We don't know how long it lasts for certain, um, but at least at last throughout the entire flu season, at least out through, through a year probably. Um, from the data from the 2009 H1N1 outbreak, we know that many of our older adults never got H1N1. Um, and that was because when they looked, they found tighter responses to H1N1, very similar. And this is something that hadn't been in the circulating environment since 1958. So uh, the immunity probably lasts a long time. Uh, and so it's never too early to give it. It will last. It will continue to protect you throughout the entire flu season. So when we get it in August, we start immunizing. And that's the recommendation of the CDC. Um, it's a very important uh, one because if you miss that first opportunity, it may be your only opportunity to get that person. So in terms of when you stop, that is a big question. The National Influenza Immunization Week is in December. It's usually about the, around the 8th of December. Um, and we put it there because we want to emphasize late season immunizations. I would actually say even years like this, and, and actually you should go throughout at least through March with your immunizations, capturing everyone that you can. And if you are seeing a late season like this year, it is probably appropriate to go through April and May, depending on what the flu is doing in, in, in your area. So there's no hard cutoff date as to when to stop. Um, but if you're seeing flu late in the season, as we are this year, um, you should probably continue it on. It's not too late to be immunizing right now for that. So. And actually, Dave, can I just point out also in uh, New York City, what we actually tell our providers is to start vaccinating when you get the vaccine and keep vaccinating until it expires. Um, New York City has had outbreaks really as late as May for flu, and so it's important that they keep on continuing to vaccinate. And that was in, with the 2009 H1N1, that particular yeah. year, we saw the spike in, in, in April, April uh, week 16 it was, um, at 2.30 p.m. Um, I know because I pulled the alarm um, in our facilities. But uh, it also spiked over the summer, so July, August, September. There was a, a huge spike. So, Yeah, I think the whole concept of a flu season is really sort of going that out the, the way, and we're bringing in the idea that flu circulates year-round, and it's important to acknowledge that and protect against it all year. Other questions? Uh, the lady over here. <laughs> Uh, for years like this, that's not a problem because it's matching pretty well. Um, it is 98% matched for the H1N1 component. It is 78.8% matched for the uh, H3N2 component. And influenza B, it's yeah, about 52, 42, somewhere around there. Um, we'll, we'll get that one because we're going to probably see a quadrivalent vaccine, which will cover two influenza Bs, two influenza As. But to get those years, um, such as the eh, 2004, 2005 year, where there was a shortage, then we got the vaccine in and it did match. They actually looked, um, Marshfield, Wisconsin, they did an analysis um, of healthcare workers. Uh, and uh, they, they looked at people coming in and they still found that despite the mismatch of that season, there was still protective efficacy of about 40%. Um, for, I think for, the, for one of the components, it was, it was substantially lower in the 20s, um, but the H, I think it was H3N2 had a, at least a 42%, if I remember correctly, um, it was the H3N2, that, that, that there was protective efficacy there, even without the exact match. So, um, and that's what I, us I usually tell people, it's not going to be perfect. And you may even still get flu but you won't get the severe complications because you'll get some benefit from it. So, uh, let's see, the gentleman right here. Um, am I correct that, that hepatitis B and measles and all those are mandatory? That is actually, um, uh, that's actually a good, um, hepatitis B under OSHA is required that we offer 
that we offer it to every single healthcare worker within 10 days, I believe it is, of employment, and um, and after we provide education, and if they refuse it, they must sign a declination. So it's a mandatory participation. They either get it or they have to sign their life away in terms of it. That particular program is an employee benefit directed program. It's protecting the the employee. Um, it's less protective of the uh, of the of the patient and its scope. So it's a little bit different, very similar. Um, one of the arguments I think it has been in New York is uh, that we've uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong is that we've been mandating measles um, vaccination in, in facilities for quite a long time, um, and that's something certainly that we can do f- to prevent the spread of a very a serious disease. So. Yeah, I think some of the uh, requirements will vary by state, uh, so that's important to keep in mind that you look specifically for where you're practicing. But um, just as Dave mentioned, in New York, that is an argument that we do use. Uh, the concept of requiring vaccinations for healthcare workers isn't a new thing. It doesn't pertain only to influenza. Um, yeah, I bring that up because what the hell is the problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, how many yeah. people here know somebody that died from the flu vaccine? So, from the flu vaccine. I was going to say, you know, I've got 20, 40, 60. I've got 80 bucks in my pocket. I'll give it to you if you can show me somebody that died from the flu vaccine. So, um, I don't have $80, but I think I know somebody that got together. So, that, that is a, a, an interesting association. They've actually looked at that over the seasons, over the years. Guillain-Barre is not associated with the flu vaccine definitively. Uh, we cannot form any conclusion. What we do know is that the number of immunizations for, our, for influenza have skyrocketed. We've gone to 120 million or 128 million vaccines administered this year. What's the incidence of Guillain-Barre done? Flat. Flat or slight decrease. If it was associated we would definitely see a rise in the number of cases. So, um, so that's, and that's one of the things I use with patients. It can come from influenza itself, which is the other thing to kind of keep in mind. It can come from, you know, if the wind blows from the west or, you know, if there's a virus, anything like that. So. Yeah, for for the for the live attenuated vaccine, the the uh, nasal mist, uh, there is a possibility that you would would get a very mild. I mean, it's a it's a live vaccine. It's not going to cause. It's attenuated, so it's not going to cause full blown uh, flu. And it certainly could be the reaction of the immune system. Um, and for the inactivated vaccine, it is not alive. So there's no. We believe in the United States in the germ theory of infection. So. Um, that means that you have to have an infecting organism, so a killed vaccine is not going to going to do that certainly. But he makes a good point. But it's, Yep. Exactly. But I think there's also the issue <laughs> of uh, someone who receives the vaccine and their body mounting an immune response right. to it yep. as well, which can cause some of those similar symptoms. Uh, Zach in the back. Do you understand what the methodology for identifying uh, non-employee providers' uh, vaccine status was? Okay. The sorry, you didn't understand how they were. Their va- to identify the vaccine vaccination status of the non-employee providers. Yeah, and that was the problem, Um, (laughs) that they could give us, like we said, they could give us a denominator so they knew who their population was, but then collecting data about their vaccination status was a huge issue. The only ones that they seemed to be okay with reporting for that that numerator was uh, those that had received it, because if they had received it, then they had signed the VIS or whatever they had, whatever whatever their policy is. If they had received it elsewhere, they were hard to capture unless they ran into them. They're hospitalists, so they see them all the time. They ran into them in the hall and could say, by the way, how have you been vaccinated or have you been vaccinated? But that was a, that was a big issue, for, especially for the larger facilities. The, the physician offices where there were four staff, simple, fine, that's not an issue. Um, for the smaller hospitals, not an issue. But these larger facilities, they're really hard to, hard to collect that data. So that's why the groups have been narrowed. Yeah, I think also in New York we saw that some of the 
facilities, they really have the experience where they have a number of credentialed, you know, medical attendings on staff with them, mostly for insurance purposes, but they've never even set foot in the hospital. And, uh, you know, one of the strategies we were trying to incorporate was uh, to use the credentialing office as a means to reaching out to these people and doing some follow-up. So, it, you know, it varies uh, what's feasible depending on the institution. Uh, I think, Zach, did you have a question in the back? I, I will point out I have a conflict of interest. I am doing a study. It's funded by Sanofi. It's investigator initiated. I came up with the idea. They don't touch the design. So um, the study is ongoing. Um, I have no interim results, um, nor would I release them until I did a thorough data analysis. Um, my position, uh, it, on behalf of the American Medical Directors Association, uh, the position that we have taken is the same that the ACIP has taken, which is it's a vaccine that's out there, it's available, and it's FDA approved. We do not have preference of that vaccine over any other vaccine. So um, the jury is out. So. I, I just want to point out, too, in New York, um, you know, that is sort of the recommendation. There's no preferential recommendation, but in our immunization clinics uh, that we conduct throughout the city, we do use high-dose flu for our seniors. Uh, let's see. Um, you. <laughs> Yeah, that declination form actually has been, uh, um, it, it, you have to have evidence that the patient was offered the vaccine. Now, you don't have to have the, to, to, in terms of the staff, um, the, it, it's probably a jurisdiction issue um, because actually um, there's no requirement under the federal licensure regulations to offer the vaccine to your staff. That is not a federal licensure regulation. It is a state by state, like in Pennsylvania, we have Act 95, which uh, required that uh, that we offer it to our healthcare workers. Um, but it's not necessarily covered for that. The other thing that, that's important that I want to add on there is consent forms are not required. They are not allowed in any of my buildings. I will shoot the first person on site who has a consent form because they are a barrier to, to getting into, you know, you have this 40,000 page long thing and it's not considered a standard care. That still comes up and is, a, I think, an important issue. Uh, Maryland is the only state that requires it. Illinois does not. California does not. Maryland is the only state that requires a consent form. Oh, surveyors will say that. There, there is surveyor opinion and reality. So there is only one state, Maryland. So, yes. If you uh, run into uh, reluctance on the part of these big uh, personal chains to make it a mandate, that's a mandated uh, for medical legal reasons that we're still on, no fear of liability. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on your experience from, from uh, New York and from um, New Mexico in terms of that. I did not work with the chains myself in terms of looking at this. I know it's always an issue. Sorry, that, I couldn't hear part of it. So, that. it's the issue of um, uh, is there any resistance from the chains? In terms of man, uh, mandatory programs, is there any resistance to their acceptance of that concept? Um, which chains? Uh, the oh, the, the nursing home chains. Oh, oh. So. <laughs> um, no, I haven't come across uh, too much with that. My work with the nursing home specifically has been kind of limited. We have another uh, person that does actually a lot of extensive work with the nursing homes, um, and based on some of her work. Um, I think in general there's opposition to any type of mandate, um, but with the nursing homes in New York, they do uh, pay close attention to employee vaccination. And so some of our rates for nursing home uh, vaccination is much better than some of our other institutions. For New Mexico, we worked um, mostly with state-run facilities, um, but the few facilities who were private, um, I could sense that they weren't as enthusiastic about you know, I, I'm in a kind of litigious state, and I know, like in my office, even if there's something that I thought was a very good idea for somebody to do, I was reluctant to twist yeah. their arm too yeah. hard to do it. 
in case they had an adverse, a bad outcome, related or not. You just said it was perceived to be related, you know. Yeah. If, you know, you, you have the potential for bad will, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in New York, you know, for a very short period, there was a state uh, mandate in place uh, during the time of H1N1, and there was a lot of opposition to it, and, you know, there was a lot of threats of, you know, legal activity. And then, you know, the state actually rescinded, rescinded the mandate because of the vaccine shortage, um, and so they didn't really have to deal with those issues, but they are still there. And I think it's part of the reason that they really haven't investigated it or looked into it further at this point. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As as long as it's narrowed to a specific focus, it's a condition of employment, and it's narrowed to um, uh, um, patient safety. Uh, with that narrow focus, it has been upheld, actually. There have been court challenges. Um, there's the concept of going back and retroactively requiring everybody else. Uh, but there are things that you can do. The masking policy, uh, particularly Geisinger has done this quite nicely, um, where you can sign the declination form, but you must wear a mask. Um, and that becomes narrow, and that, that cannot be challenged because it is patient safety. It's a narrow focus. And uh, in Pennsylvania, we've seen a number of facilities in the western part of the state that have gone mandatory. Um, the Lehigh Valley system, uh, the um, uh, University of Pennsylvania system, uh, University of Pittsburgh, I am um, uh, very dismayed to say, um, and hopefully this is on tape, that we have not gone to a mandatory program. I am, bar- I am very much embarrassed by it. And working with the State Department of Health, they are also embarrassed for us. Um, and uh, we're trying to shame them into changing. So, But uh, we've worked on it for a number of years, of many of us. But yeah, each system has to kind of come to their conclusion of that at, at, their, at their own um, pace, uh, as it is. Just to add to that, um, the CMS has added, um, you know, to their IPPS um, quality reporting um, system that the, that the measure, um, th- sorry, they've added the measure to their quality reporting program. So, so as facilities, um, and specifically for acute care hospitals first, and that's the first set for 2013, as they're having to report this rate, um, I'm hoping that that will sort of give them that push. Um, like, as I said, acute care first, and then they've already talked about ambulatory surgery centers next for the 2014 report. And so as we add sort of um, facility groups or these types of institutions, my hope is that people really get on board. And if not mandatory, at least mandatory participation or just start really looking at their rates. Uh, yes. You know, actually, uh, quite a number of facilities do that. Um, w- within our own facilities, we actually do that. And when there is an outbreak, there is signage that's posted, and we ask you to stay away. Um, we, it's not 100%, uh, particularly if you have somebody on hospice and they're dying. You do not want to exclude the family at those, at those point in times. Um, Mark Twain actually de- dealt with that with his wife. His wife had heart disease. She was dying, and then the doctor kept him from going into the room, and he would pass love notes to her under the door. Um, so it, that's a point in your life where you need to be together, and this, the concept that you should say is, is not, not correct. But um, we do try to discourage visitation. But we also very much discourage if you're coughing and you're sick, we tell you to go home uh, during that time frame as well. Um, but it's not a, something that you can do 100%. Uh, Yeah, yeah. We have a letter that goes out that it says, you know, we've got this outbreak going on. Exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. 
feel free to email us and if, yeah. or see us around the conference. I'm, I'm always happy to, to answer. I'm always, if, if you get me started talking on the flu, I'll never shut up. So I'm sorry. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.